academic ceremony at Maastricht University. First of all, I welcome Mr. Til Syme. He will defend his academic thesis, The Role of Smooth Muscle Cells in Calcification of Atherosclerotic Plaques. And I will also introduce the, I will welcome the members of the committee and I will introduce the three supervisors. And um, I will welcome uh, Professor Scheurgers. He is Professor of Biochemistry of Vascular Calcification at Maastricht University. Um, Professor Ulf Hedin, he is senior lecturer in the Faculty of Vascular Surgery at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, and Associate Professor Lubica Perisic Maltic, lecturer of molecular medicine and surgery also at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. And I welcome also, of course, all the followers of the live stream. And I will introduce the six opponents later during the ceremony. Mr. Simon, may I invite you to present a summary of your thesis? Please go ahead. Can you all see my screen now? Yes, it's good. Great. So I will start. Dear Pro-Rector, dear members of the Corona, dear family, friends, and audience, welcome to the defense of my thesis with the title, The Role of Smooth Muscle Cells in Calcification of Atherosclerotic Plaques. Calcification is a predominant feature of cardiovascular disease, the foremost cause of global mortality. Stroke is the second biggest killer within the group of cardiovascular diseases, um, causing up to 5.5 million deaths annually. This is still almost double the amount of deaths related to COVID-19 in 2020. Cardiovascular diseases comprise conditions affecting the heart and blood vessels throughout the human body. Within this thesis, we have assessed calcification in two pathologies, namely carotid artery stenosis, causing up to one fourth of all strokes, and aortic valve stenosis. Both can be characterized by lipid accumulation, chronic inflammation, subsequent fibrosis and calcification, a process called atherosclerosis, often, cause, often causing lethal complications. But how does atherosclerotic calcification look like? Here you can see the neck uh, computed tomography angiography image of a patient with the highly calcified plaque in the, cart in the carotid artery clearly visible and almost indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the bones forming the, um, uh, the spine and the skull of the patient. These highly calcified nodules can later also be, see, be seen in the carotid endarterectomy extracted from the patient during surgery. And they can be visualized within the tissue by plaque histology. The formation of calcified matrix can be resembled by stimulation of structural cells in vitro with osteogenic stimuli. This is usually connected to a distinct phenotypic transformation of these cells. However, recent research has shown that calcification is often enriched in asymptomatic patients and patients on stabilizing medications like statins. Furthermore, macrocalcification can pose a biomechanically stabilizing uh, factor in comparison, in comparison to large lipid pools and microcalcification within the tissue. Additionally, smooth muscle cell phenotypic plasticity has been characterized to be a causal driver of calcification progression. These findings highlight the outstanding clinical need for more detailed image analysis and a link to gene expression as well as a deeper understanding of local plaque biomechanics and their influence on the plaque stability, as well as the need for molecular markers of smooth muscle cell and other structural cell osteogenic transition. By combining analysis of biobank samples, transcriptomics, in vitro and in vivo models, as well as in silico models. In this thesis, we aim to relate the calcification rate to gene expression, investigate novel molecular markers of calcification and osteogenic transition, as well as defining the influence of macrocalcification on local plaque biomechanics in order to gain insight into cell transformation and disease markers driving calcification and in turn disease progression. 
The starting point of all studies were human biobanks, spanning carotid artery stenosis, aortic valve stenosis, aortic atherosclerotic disease progression, and chronic kidney disease. The samples and data collected within these biobanks allowed patient-related tissue morphology and gene expression analysis. Clinical imaging was further evaluated in more detail by 3D in silico models. And targets validated in in vivo and in vitro models of internal hyperplasia, early plaque formation, calcification, and biomechanical stimulation. The combination of these resources and methods allowed us to relate morphological features commonly considered vulnerable plaque markers to biological disease processes. In the first study, we wanted to understand how calcification could be related to decreased patient symptomatology by relating mo the morphological feature of carotid calcification to gene expression profiles and disease biology. Calcification was classic classified via CTA imaging and subsequent analysis, and histological and molecular analysis was conducted on, on the corresponding tissue in order to define a patient-specific transcriptomic phenotype. Patient stratification by CTA and histological validation was followed by tra plaque transcriptomic analysis revealing biological pathways of smooth muscle cell contraction, elastic fiber assembly, and extracellular matrix composition to be upregulated in highly calcified plaques, while immune system processes, lipid transport, and extracellular matrix catabolism was rather downregulated. In the course of this study, we discovered proteoglycan-4, or commonly called lubricin, as a novel gene in atherosclerotic calcification. It is a big molecule of over 300 kilodalton with a protein structure resembling vitronectin. However, it has additional muxin-like repeats containing about 170 negatively charged O-link oligosaccharides, which stretch the molecule into a rod-like structure. It is commonly expressed by synovial chondrocytes and has the ability to aggregate, bind to collagen, and other extracellular matrix molecule, molecules, as well as heparin. In low calcified plaques, we found a wide expression of PRG4 within the extracellular matrix, but especially around CD68 positive cells. Whereas in highly calcified plaques, it also overlapped with smooth muscle actin positive stain, as well as trap surrounding the highly calcified nodules. To summarize, we found that highly calcified plaques exhibit a distinct transcriptomic phenotype with upregulation of biological pathways, generally related to, a more, to more increased stability compared to low calcified plaques. In studies two and three, which I will present together, we wanted to find out if PRG4 has anything to do with the progressing um, extracellular matrix calcification. By assessment of human tissues representing atherosclerotic disease progression, we found that PRG4 was upregulated already early during intimal thickening and coincided with, with expression of the chondrogenic marker SOX9. While at this stage, visual calcification and other osteogenic markers were still lacking. Later, it surrounded the forming necrotic core and also overlapped with osteogenic marker RUNX2 as well as in late stages with trap positivity, as well as Van Willebrand factor, likely marking um, extracellular matrix regions of high remodeling surrounding highly calcified nodules. Similarly, in aortic valve leaflets, PRG4 was already upregulated in thickened regions, as well as in late stage calcified regions. We utilized in vivo models to recapitulate the early disease initiation and calcification formation, and again found PRG4 to be upregulated early and preceding the formation of macrocalcification, again coinciding with upregulation of the chondrogenic marker SOX9. To assess the cellular source of PRG4, 
We treated primary human smooth muscle cells and valvular interstitial cells with procalcific anthrogenic stimuli. We found that both calcium and phosphate, as well as OxLDL and specifically TGF-beta, induced a rapid upregulation of PRG4, correlating with upregulation of the transcription factor SMUT3 and SOX9 and downregulation of typical contractile markers, which was later confirmed also by knockdown experiments. Interestingly, high phosphate led to the same outcome, but with slightly different impact on some typical contractile markers. To analyze the effect of extracellular PRG4, we added full-length recombinant human protein to the same in vitro conditions and found that both with calcium as well as in phosphate stimulation, it upregulated ectopic calcification. However, it also led to inhibited migration and proliferation of smooth muscle cells and maintained within them a more contractile phenotype. Combining samples of human pathology in vivo and in vitro models, we could show that PRG4 induction is connected to an osteogenic transformation due to atherogenic plaque environment. It likely increases the formation of calcification, but also supports basic smooth muscle cell differentiation. In the final study, we returned to the question of macrocalcification and plaque stability and tested another hypothesis of altered tissue biomechanics within highly calcified plaques. Could it even be that, put, that the rigid matrix acts as a support beam in a high risk environment and thereby affecting smooth muscle cell phenotype? We generated a pipeline based on patient CTA and conducted in silico morphology annotation and finite element analysis to calculate the substrate stretch throughout the vessel wall. We translated this substrate stretch to an in vitro cyclic stretch model and finally characterized the smooth muscle cell phenotypic adaptation to gain an insight into the local plaque environment and likely smooth muscle cell condition within the lesion. 3D tissue morphology annotation was conducted by a vasco cap, or how it is now called, elusive vivo, and applied to finite element modeling with a focus on calcification. We calculated the principal stretch across three sections distal to the bifurcation, which enabled us to follow the tissue stiffness as well as principal stretch throughout the vessel wall. The substrate stretch was then um, modeled for the matrix component, where a rigid cultural plate is, most, uh, is, is the closest to the conditions uh, for cells in direct proximity to the macrocalcification, whereas a soft silicon membrane with no stretch corresponded to cells in close proximity to the macrocalcification and up to 12.5% stretch for cells that are further away from the calcification and closer to the lumen. Applying this model, we found that stretch and biomechanical stimulation support smooth muscle cell alignment and, like, and are likely necessary for functional contractility as uh, cells under stretch express much higher levels of myosin heavy chain 11. However, uh, cells on, on, under low stretch conditions expressed higher, um, had higher expression for most cytoskeletal markers, even those that are, those that are commonly lost early during transdifferentiation. Interestingly, smooth muscle cells express quite high levels of PLG4 on, when grown on the soft tissue, whereas they almost express no PLG4 on a rigid culture plate. Furthermore, low stretch con conditions appear to increase osteogenic potential highlighted by RUNX2 expression. Furthermore, we found that smooth muscle cells were able to cope with calcifying conditions much better under low stretch conditions by showing rapid apoptosis when combining high stretch and calcification. To summarize, we explored a our explored pipeline allows estimation of cellular transformation based on, based on patient CTA. 
we could show that substrate stretch is reduced by macrocalcification within late stage lesions, affecting smooth muscle cell phenotype by supporting smooth muscle cell survival, but also osteogenic transformation. This may be the lesser evil in late stage disease as increased stretch leads to apoptosis within the atherogenic milieu. To summarize, we have learned that highly calcified plaques exhibit a distinct profile of biological pathways related to a more stable phenotype in late stage atherosclerotic disease. PRG4 is a molecular marker related to early osteogenic transformation of smooth muscle cells and valvular interstitial cells in response to atherogenic stimuli. It likely contributes to extracellular matrix calcification, but also mediates restoration of more differentiated phenotypes in smooth muscle cells. Finally, we explore the pipeline to link non-invasive clinical imaging to cell biology. With this, I would like to thank again my supervisors for all their support, the whole vascular surgery group for the good times in the lab, as well as the Intricare Consortium and all the external collaborators for their outstanding contribution to this research. With this, I would like to thank for your attention and give now the work back to the pro-rector. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Simon, for your clear presentation. The opposition will be opened by the chair of the thesis assessment committee, uh, Professor Schalkwijk, and he's professor of experimental internal medicine at Maastricht University. Professor Schalkwijk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, dear candidate, uh, first of all, of course, I would like to con congratulate you uh, and also your promotion team with this uh, excellent thesis, I must say, and a very nice collaboration between Maastricht and uh, Karolinska. And for me, it was a real pleasure to read it and uh, also impressed actually because of the quality of the work, but also of the relevance of the work. So uh, once again, my compliments for that. So you have said it very nicely, actually, the, uh, the role of uh, smooth muscle cells in calcification uh, in atherosclerotic plaques. And you found that also uh, calcification, macro calcification, is associated with a more stable phenotype of the plaque. So we also know that these, and you very nicely explained that in the introduction, that this can be detected by CT. But we also know that CT can be used as a risk predictor for poor outcome yeah, for cardiovascular disease. And you found actually that calcification actually is linked to a better phenotype of the plaque. So how can we explain that actually? Uh, that we can use CT as a kind of a risk predictor for outcome, also uh, based on your results in your thesis. So please. Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for this very nice question. And this is of course very relevant and that's why I pointed out that we need more detailed image analysis because this is really the point. Um, the risk prediction via CT imaging usually relies purely on the volume of calcification. However, when we also assess the density of the calcification, um, it has already been shown before then it, that it can be turned around and can actually be used as a predictor for a better outcome. Mm -hmm. And this is really the point because um, before macro calcifications aggregate into sheet-like dense structures, um, I mean, from between, the, between micro calcifications, nodular macro calcification and sheet-like uh, macro calcifications, there is a path where calcification can definitely disrupt plaque tissue, whereas the highly dense macro calcifications that we find in very late stages can actually be a stabilizing factor. So can it, can it also be that, that maybe some of the micro calcifications can be detected by CT? I have no idea, I'm not expert in that, but, but is that a possibility because micro calcification is actually linked to an unfavorable uh, plaque stability. That is exactly correct. Microcalcification is very most often linked uh, to a negative outcome. However, how, however uh, by definition, microcalcification cannot be detected by a CT because the resolution is too low. 
Um, spotty macro calcification can be detected by CT and can still sometimes be related to a worse outcome. But most often on the CT, we would see uh, dense like sheet, uh, sheet like uh, macro calcification. And this can be connected to a more stable black phenotype. So, what are, in your opinion, the best methods, detection techniques? To, to detect actually the calcification uh, in a micro uh, domain? Uh, micro, um, I'm not aware of uh, clinical um, imaging modalities at the moment that can detect micro calcification. I mean, there, there, are, um, there is of course a lot of research being done at the moment to, to use markers or um, uh, imaging agents to to mark micro the development of microcalcification, but it's not in clinical use yet. Okay. So I think what the, the best that we can do at the moment is to add to the assessment of volume of calcification via CT the assessment of density. Okay. Okay. So also in relation to your study, uh, so you have uh, found actually uh, the relevance of protoglycan four. And uh, so very nice experiments, uh, very convincing. But do you think that we can maybe use also that knowledge uh, regarding risk prediction uh, based on the outcomes? So can we add maybe proteoglycan 4 uh, to, to a, a risk factor score or whatsoever? Uh, or maybe other phenotypes of the smooth muscle cells as you have found? Is, is, have you any ideas about that? So with proteoglycan 4 in particular, um, the research that I have done on proteoglycan 4 is connected to proteoglycan 4 in the extracellular matrix. So to use it as a biomarker, it would li most likely be if it is shed into the, into the circulation by plaque erosion, for example. However, I imagine that um, the future will look more like that we have a better understanding and more data on the um, phenotypic profiles, for example, of smooth muscle cells in relation to um, the, uh, the image data banks that we have and that we con can connect or relate the um, non-invasive imaging to a better understanding of um, the smooth muscle cell phenotype within this plague, as we, as I showed in this um, exploratory study, the study four, the last study that we did, if we have more data like that, we can actually estimate um, the, the smooth muscle cell phenotype and the plaque phenotype only based on non-invasive imaging. Okay, so uh, just because of curiosity, are the data that that uh, that uh, uh, proteoglycan four is shedded actually in circulation? I mean, a lot of matrix proteins are shedded in the circulation and can be used for risk prediction. Is the same true for proteoglycan four? So, uh, to to my knowledge, there isn't such data yet, and it is, it has been uh, different difficult to assess because there are no available ELISAs for PRG4 at the moment. Um, our collaborator from the Lubris company and um, uh, University of Connecticut, um, Tannen Schmidt, he is developing ELISAs, but it is, it is somewhat difficult because um, the structure is um, uh, similar to vitronectin, which is of course very abundant in, in the circulation. So to have an ELISA that is specific for PRG4 has been tough to develop. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm really satisfied with your response. And also because of time, I will give the word back to the prorector. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Schalkwerk. The opposition will be continued by uh, Professor uh, Haldo Sen. He is uh, Associate Professor in Molecular Endocrinology at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Thank you, prorector, uh, dear candidate. I must uh, also express my um, uh, congratulations to this uh, very nice uh, thesis. I very much enjoyed reading it, the summary, and also the, uh, uh, in the papers that were that are included in this. Uh, as um, said here, I'm a molecular en endocrinologist and um, looking at uh, sort of a cellular level of um, signaling, both receptors and also the pathways. And um, 
I was was say also that I'm very impressed about the different models and the sample, clinical samples down to gene expression analysis. We have used um, animals and uh, primary cells also. And I will focus on the use of these primary cells. You used uh, primary human carotid as a, a smooth muscle cells and also human optic smooth muscle cells. And um, I was very happy also in the papers to read the limitations part because uh, I mean, cell models, they are very, very nice to use, but you must be very uh, much aware of that they can lead you in the total wrong direction. And you should be careful, perhaps not always to generalize. So, so, so uh, I think that was um, very, very nice to read. Um, I was thinking about paper three, where you used these primary cells and you uh, looked at the expression of PRG4. Uh, can you tell me why the, you used uh, several different hormones or growth factors? How did you choose them? So, um, highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for the very relevant question. Um, I think you're uh, referring to the to the first exploratory graph where we used uh, several different cytokines, TNF alpha, interferon gamma, TGF beta, and so on. Um, mm -hmm. So these factors were chosen because they they all of them have been shown to play a role in an atherosclerotic disease um, or plaque formation and progression. So we so it was an exploratory um, experiment to find out if any of these are related to stimulation of PRG4 or if it is really only the formation of early microcalcification uh, resembled by the addition of high calcium and phosphate conditions, which would trigger this uh, stimulation. And we found that some of them did, especially as I showed TGF beta, but also interferon gamma to some extent, IGF-1 in the very early um, phase, but not TNF-alpha, which was surprising because that would be a typical um, pro-inflammatory cytokine. Okay. Um, can you exclude TNF-alpha from this? I mean, did you have the control for TNF-alpha? Do you mean Can you say that uh, that it worked? Uh, that the stimulation with the TNF alpha um, worked on the smooth muscle cells uh, in, in the, the experimental setup you had. Uh, yes, because um, this this experimental setup uh, was used in in, in previous uh, publications where we showed that um, TNF alpha stimulated um, an inflammatory phenotypic change in smooth muscle cells. Okay, so you, you had some sort of uh, knowledge that uh, in this experimental setup, the TNF alpha was uh, sort of working. Exactly. Okay. Uh, how did you choose the concentrations? Did you do a concentration curve for each of these, or did you pick it from the literature? Yeah, um, concentrations in, in, in the cases of the cytokines were picked from the literature or previous experiments conducted in our lab where we had good experience with their, with their stimulatory effects. The concentration of the recombinant PRG4 stimulation was picked also from previous experiments mm -hmm. that were conducted in vivo and adapted to these, to these levels to, um, to resemble something that could also work in physiology. Mm -hmm. Okay, so from this, you uh, could see that the TDF beta one was the most potent. And then you sort of continued with that uh, and looked at uh, the, the uh, downstream uh, mediators of that. Uh, but I'm a little bit amazed or, or sorry, when looking at all of these growth factors and um, you have used, I mean, there's a rather many signaling pathways activated, different pathways. Is there a common point where they go together and end up at uh, the 
with the SMAD3 and the SOX9, or, or, or is this, because it seems first sight that this gene, PRG4, it's rather promiscuous, it can be activated even by OX LDL, and it's also a negative feedback also, I think, with PRG4 there. So, so it must be a lot of signaling pathways and components activated. H have you th had some thought about that? Yes, thank you for the very good question. Yeah, I've, I've given a, a lot of thought throughout these four years, how it can be. And um, my, my best guess is that um, PRG4 upregulation is actually a, uh, a reaction to different kinds of cellular stress. So is, is it, if it is um, biomechanical stress, or if it is oxidizing stress, or if it is calcifying stress. And that might also be to, due to the properties of the proteoglycan 4 molecule, um, how it is able to capture cations that would otherwise stress the cell, how it is able to uh, form a lubri uh, lubricating coat around the cells if they are stressed biomechanically. Um, and the, I, I think the common, um, the common mediator between the pathways might be MAP kinases, because it is known that uh, under different forms of stress, uh, MAP kinases are upregulated in smooth muscle cells, almost typical to, to cancer cells, and, and that this might be a common regulator. Did you test with some, have you tested with some MAP kinase inhibitor? No, we haven't, we haven't gone that deep into the pathway. Um, it, it would be very interesting, but I have to, I have to admit that since we found this, um, this proteoglycan um, as, a, as, a, as a fresh gene in, in atherosclerotic calcification, I, I started pretty much from scratch. So I, I, would, I would love to have another four years to figure out all the details. Okay. Dear candidate, thank you for a very nice discussion. We're happy with that. And uh, I give the word back to ProRector. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Haldorsen. The next opponent is uh, Professor Lewandowski. He is Professor of Neurovascular Biology at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, dear candidate, for the opportunity to read your thesis. It was uh, a very pleasurable read. It spans a lot of uh, perspectives one can have on the calcifications in blood vessels. My question is uh, largely hypothetical. We're talking about calcifications as a deposition of calcium. But do we know where does the calcium come from? Is this a systemic origin, like in the blood flow? Is this a cellular origin? What in your regard is the, is the source of calcification? At least the interponent, thank you a lot for the very relevant question. Um, so I have given it some thought also in the, in the part of my thesis where I described the, the axis between bone biology and vascular calcification. So I believe some, some um, amount of the calcium overload in our vasculature will, be, uh, will come from um, a reduction of bone density and, and calcium content within the bones in cardiovascular diseases via um, systemic regulators like FGF23 and Clotho, uh, which also has been shown. Then on the other hand, it is of course also a matter of um, kidney function, for example, and, and diet, which, um, which can lead to different uh, amounts of calcium, um, circulating calcium within the vasculature. And then finally, it also comes down to the atherosclerotic disease progression, where, um, where the disease usually starts with an, with an infiltration of lipids and, and inflammatory cells. Um, which can later then um, lead to the, um, to the influx of calcium, which would usually not penetrate the vessel wall. Okay, uh, so this is uh, touching on the systemic sources of calcium, for example, diet and the sort of age-associated loss of uh, bone density. Um, but then, okay, let me expand a bit on that. So then one would expect epidemiological evidence of diet 
associated with uh, more intense uh, calcification. Is this uh, part of the uh, sort of known literature? Because frankly, I'm not aware of it, but one would, following your assumption, one would expect this kind of association in epidemiology to, to exist. I, I assume, Are you aware of it? Um, I, I'm aware that it is probably clouded by the confounding factor of age and the very heterogeneous um, type of um, assessment of diets within a population. Um, so I, I assume the, the, um, the biggest factor will always be age related and um, when it comes to cardiovascular diseases, yes. Okay, how about uh, possible cellular sources of uh, local deposition of, uh, of calcium? Well, of course there is, um, so one, one way of, uh, cal of early calcification formation is the overload of calcium or phosphate of the cells, which then release calcifying vesicles. On the other hand, what I have also um, shown in, uh, in part in my studies is that, for example, TGF-beta or other TGF-beta pathway um, activators like BMPs lead to osteogenic transformation of structural cells, for example, smooth muscle cells, which will then actually form a matrix that is mineralized similar to endochondral um, ossification. Um, which would then be a very active process of forming um, calcified matrix around these cells. So do we know which uh, cells secrete those vesicles loaded with uh, calcium phosphate? Is this, uh, yes. these be the smooth muscle cells? Yes, exactly. So there's, there has been a very nice research done by Kathy Shanahan uh, Kathy Shanahan's group and uh, Kapustin, if I remember correctly, on the uh, release of um, extracellular calcifying vesicles, as well as um, uh, uh -huh, yeah, and and as well as macrophages, um, which are also highly active uh, with that regard. Uh, to to follow uh, a bit more. Knowing how skeletal muscles work is that they need the calcium in order to exert contraction, right? And smooth muscle cells also exert contraction. And then the calcium is stored in the endoplasmatic reticulum and then it's spontaneously released to, to facilitate contraction. Do you think that the calcium secretion could be part of the de de differentiation of smooth muscle cells? Because non-contractile smooth muscle cells would not need to, to use calcium? That, that, is, a, that is a very interesting, um, interesting um, way of thought. I actually have to admit that I haven't uh, thought about it in this way yet, but it is very true that when smooth muscle cells undergo uh, trans differentiation that they first would lose their contractile features. And even if they regain them in later stages, they're mo most often not functionally contractile, but more similar to myofibroblasts with a strong cytoskeleton. So it, it, it could be very likely that uh, this is actually the case. Mm -hmm. So that, following that assumption, the fact that we have calcifications in, in muscle or in vessels in general would be a consequence of the de-differentiation of smooth muscle cells, release of the unnecessary calcium not necessarily for the contractions anymore. So it could be kind of a bystander effect uh, uh, as well of the de-differentiation of you the may, You may give a short answer, please. Yes, one minute left. Yeah, thank you. So um, we, we know that calcification is usually a follower of the, um, of the infiltration of lipids and inflammation, which leads to initial trans-differentiation of smooth muscle cells. So um, the, the way that you put it is, it is quite likely. However, it is not quite a bystander because it has severe effects for the later uh, progression of the disease. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very satisfied with the answer and I give the uh, word back to the director. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lewandowski. The opposition will be continued by Professor Malmström. He's Professor of Biochemistry and Matrix Biology at Lund University in Sweden.
Professor Malmström. So, well, pro-rector and uh, candidate, I'm happy to uh, be had the possibility to read this very interesting thesis. I am a connected tissue biochemist, and I would like to focus a bit on lubricin. Could you tell me what is the structure of of of, of lubricin, or PGR four, as you call it? Um, are you referring to the to the um, genet? Uh, I mean, to the amino acid structure? No, or to no the, 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 I'm interested of was the, the, that that next next opponent will take. I will look on the carbohydrates. I'm sorry, highly esteemed opponent, I, I forgot to address you properly. Um, the carbohydrates, um, referring to the to the muxin-like repeats or to the to um, the the side chain of um, or the chondroitin sulfate uh, side chain of proteoglycan. Mm -hmm. Is it chondroitin sulfate or dermatin sulfate? How long is it? It, it should be chondroitin sulfate, to my knowledge. Um, how long it is exactly, I couldn't answer. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what is the function of the chondroitin sulfate in, uh, in this uh, in PGR4? Uh, I don't know specifically. Okay, let's let's go 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 to the the mucin. There are lots of mucin. It's extremely uh, highly glycosylated. Uh, 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 what function do you think that had? So on the one hand, um, I believe that this part of the molecule has the biggest function in uh, mediating its lubricating ability. So um, as they are negatively charged, it will bind a lot of water and thereby have the lubricating function. On the other hand, I believe this is also the part that causes the upregulation of ectopic calcification under calcifying conditions, as it binds cations like uh, calcium, and would therefore um, lead to an aggregation of these um, of these uh, inorganic particles. On the other hand, I also believe that it can serve as a as a protector of the smooth muscle cells as it is binding these cations, which would otherwise uh, stress the cell if they are too abundant in close proximity. Very nice. Um, you know that just half of the oligosaccharides have cy cyanic acid. I guess that is the important, important uh, sugar to, to, to uh, mobilize the calcium. Okay. I, I didn't know that so in, in so much detail. <laughs> okay, I have now a question. You using recombinant uh, uh, PGR, PGR4. What is the structure of that one? Um, I, have, I have had a lot of conversation uh, with Lubris, the company who produced this uh, recombinant PRG4 and has now sold it to the Novartis group. They believe it is the uh, fully um, glycosylated uh, form, also with the post-translational modification that is happening uh, when this protein is trafficked out of the cell. Um, this is as much information as I could get. Very interesting. I thought it was extremely difficult to make recombinant, uh, um, recombinant macromolecules with the sugar on, but they, they have, they, I tried to look at all, so I, I haven't seen the data, but that seems to, to be the case, because this is very important for, for your future studies. Exactly, yes. Very nice. Uh, if, 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 if we look on... Um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, I'm still interested of, of the, the uh, oligosaccharides. We, we, we claim that PDF4 uh, uh, influences migration and proliferation. How, how, how does that occur? Um, I believe that could occur via the binding of, of heparin. Okay. Um, and as well as maybe in a similar way as acrican and versican can um, uh, impact proliferation and migration on, of smooth muscle cells, uh, which has been shown in connection to atherosclerotic disease progression. Uh, 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 nice. Uh, heparin, there is no heparin in the tissue. What does it bind to? 
Um, it's, it's, it's a connected tissue back in with the question, of course. So, uh, I mean, first of all, I would say I, I believe the heparin would most likely come from uh, mast cells within the plaque tissue, as there are quite a few mast cells um, accumulating in, in the plaque tissue, which can release the heparin. Um, and, it, and it binds to the only intracellular proteoglycan, uh, which is uh, serglycin. Hmm. I, I thought that the, the important interaction what with, with, the, with the various heparin sulfate, syndicans, lipicans, uh, perlican, aren't, aren't they the important interactors with the, uh, uh, in this case? Interactors with with um, with the with the with the, with, the, with, the, with, the uh, with what you call the heparin binding part of the, of the lubricin. Aha, uh -huh. that that might be very true as well, since uh, since it has the ability to to bind to other extracellular molecules. Uh, that that might be true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, it's very complex molecule. Uh, you claim also in your thesis. That it it it, uh, it or it is of importance for CD CD forty four activation and toll two and toll four uh, interaction. How how do you look on that? What, what, what how does it occur? What happens? So it has been shown in the in the literature that uh, PRG four is able to directly bind to CD forty four and toll like receptors uh, four and two. Uh, in the in the synovial uh, context, mm -hmm. uh, and thereby uh, modifying the the um, macrophage macrophage uh, infiltration and polarization, um, and I think it has a similar role um, in the in the atherosclerotic plaque. At the moment, we are we are in a collaboration with Eric Beeson and uh, and Olivia in in Maastricht as well, who are um, uh, characterizing this function on macrophages. Um, we unfortunately haven't gotten around to um, analyze the function on smooth muscle cells, but smooth muscle cells also express TLR4, for example. So I believe that there could be a specific binding. Okay, thank you for very nice questions in, in a difficult area. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Malmström. The next opponent is uh, Professor Nilsson. She is Professor of Vessel Wall Biology at Lund University in Sweden. Thank you, so, thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Pro-Rector and uh, dear um, candidate. I have some questions about your figure five in, in uh, the summary of your thesis. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I, I, maybe I should start first with saying thank you so much for a very nice introduction to your thesis. Um, back to figure five. Uh, there you have a very nice uh, figure about uh, the different phenotypes of small muscle cells. And uh, uh, I say VIX, is that correct? I call them VIX, yeah. Um, uh, and there you have uh, shown that uh, on one side for the small muscle cells, you have a down regulation of contractile filaments uh, or markers. Uh, on the other hand, you have an upregulation of cytoskeletal markers in the VIX. So I was just wondering, this is a very broad uh, upregulation up of cytoskeletal markers. Can you tell me a little bit about what is this in, contra in, in comparison then to contractile uh, fila filaments in the small muscle cells? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you a lot for the for the detailed and very relevant question. So uh, first of all, why I have uh, made the layout for the figure as it is, is because I believe that uh, wicks and uh, smooth muscle cells actually, uh, so, so in their crescent phenotypes, they're quite different cells because wicks have, have low expression of what we would call in smooth muscle cells contractile markers, so cytoskeletal markers, and now you are talking about when they are in their more differentiated phenotypes. Exactly. Yeah. So when they undergo um, de-differentiation, I believe that they're actually becoming more similar and more, um, more like a progenitor phenotype that is then able to transdifferentiate into uh, different directions, such as myofibroblast-like or the osteogenic phenotype. 
So they are actually becoming more similar and to become more similar, it would uh, mean that um, contractile smooth muscle cells would downregulate mm -hmm. cytoskeletal markers and uh, VIX would upregulate cytoskeletal markers. So when you look at an activated uh, smooth muscle cell and an activated VIC in, in, in the microscope when you grow them in culture, can you distinguish between these two cell types or, or can one consider them as almost the same, the same cell? Uh, you mean from morphology or with specific stains? Uh, morphology in the first time, when you look at the cells in the microscope. I mean, from morphology, I think it is anyway very difficult to differentiate these cells, even from myofibroblasts, mm -hmm. um, yeah. when they undergo uh, transdifferentiation. They become all, all very plastic and, and uh, even just growing them for days and weeks, they would, they would change quite a quite a bit. So what do you think then uh, uh, triggers the different pathways into the osteogenic, the microfibroblast or the apoptotic pathway? Uh, once you have them activated, uh, what makes them take the next step, so to say? In uh... I believe it, it is um, on the one hand, different uh, signaling molecules. So I believe the myofibroblast-like phenotype would most likely be triggered by the TGF-beta pathway signaling, um, whereas the osteogenic phenotype might also be derived from the myofibroblast phenotype, but it is most likely uh, more related to, um, to high calcium and phosphate stimulation, um, triggering the release of calcifying uh, uh, vesicles which is actually quite similar to the, um, to the extracellular matrix uh, mineralization, which is done by osteoblasts, um, and thereby they become more, uh, more similar to osteogenic cells. Um, while the, apop I mean, the apoptosis uh, is usually triggered by, by, by an accumulation of cell damage. And uh, I mean, recent publication from Kathy Shanahan has shown that the accumulation of, uh, of DNA damage is actually also related to an upregulation of RUNX2. Um, thereby, I guess I, I make the picture not more clear, but I just show that, um, that there is a transition between all of these phenotypes. Mm. I also had some questions about your uh, methods in paper three, uh, the animal models. So I was just wondering what time points you have used for the mouse and the rat model. Uh, um, I mean, when did you sacrifice the animals after uh, the injury? So the, um, to, to first talk about the, uh, about the red model about um, with the balloon injury, there, there we um, consequently um, or su subsequently um, harvested the tissues at um, uh, zero hours or right after the injury as well as two 20 hours, um, two days, five days, two weeks, six weeks, and 12 weeks. So it is quite a, quite a um, complex and extensive experiment. Yeah, and, and you write in this paper that the uh, calcification is a late stage uh, uh, feature in, the, in, in plaques. So my question here was, uh, why did you choose uh, this uh, very early uh, models uh, to what, how did you think when you choose these two models to study your question? So the rationale was that we wanted to understand if PRG4 is really just related to the calcification or if it is actually um, uh, um, uh, a reaction to, to cellular stress that is um, um, inflicted earlier before the calcification happens. And with these models, we were actually, um, we, we had the first hints that PRG4 is expressed much earlier before the calcification happens. And then um, by, by, the, by the means that we had already discussed may induce um, ectopic calcification. Thank you so much for your answers. Thank you. Thank you, Pro-Rector. Thank you. The uh, following opponent is uh, Dr. Achten. He is uh, assistant professor at Maastricht University. Dr. Achten. Thank you, dear Prorector, dear candidate. I'd also like to congratulate you on a nice piece of work that you have presented here. And also like to congratulate your promotion team on this. 
Um, I'm a protein chemist working on vascular calcification as well, with a particular interest into post-translational modifications of proteins. Now, my own focus lies on MGP, which is a very small protein compared to your massive uh, proteoglycan 4. Uh, but I see a lot of parallels in your research uh, and mine. And I'd like to discuss a few of those uh, with you. Um, I'd like to follow up on the questions that Professor Armstrong has, has asked, but then focus on the protein side of proteoglycan 4. So could you first start by elaborating a bit on the protein part of the structure of proteoglycan 4? Yeah, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the nice question. Um, so the protein part of the um, of PRG4, as I had already uh, mentioned briefly, is to some extent um, similar to, to that of uh, vitronectin, actually to about 40%, um, uh, which includes a somatomedine B-like domain uh, on the on the N terminal end of the protein and the hemotaxin like domain on the C uh, C terminal end of the protein and then the the muxin like um, domains in the middle so to say um, so these domains uh, enable the, the the protein to on the one hand aggregate for example form dimers but then also to to bind uh, heparin um, which we had already discussed briefly before. Yeah, very nice. Um, so you've already referred to the, the post translational modifications, and I was quite intrigued by the uh, comment you made in uh, Professor Malmström's questions when you said that there were um, post translational modifications uh, other than glycosylation. Did I hear that correct, or are there? Is that not correct? That, that is indeed correct. Um, so to my knowledge, there are at least uh, two possi uh, possible uh, post-translational modifications that are happening while the protein is trafficked out of the cell. Um, so firstly, there, uh, the, the first 21 amino acids are cleaved um, either during or after secretion, most likely during the secretion of the protein. Um, and that is on the, on the N-terminal end. Um, and then there is a cleavage site actually specific for PCSK6. I don't know, you might have heard about it in relation to atherosclerosis as well, um, which happens at about 1,306 and what, between 1,306 and 1,307 amino acids. Right. And um, do you know, uh, so if I make the parallel to MGP again, um, so in my research, the very tiny protein that I use is very heavily influenced by a small modification, namely carboxylation of MDP. Yes. Um, and even missing one can lead to deleterious effects on the protein's function. Do you know what the relevance of the post-translation modifications is in proteoglycan 4? For example, if we would have a fully deglycosylated proteoglycan 4, would that still function in your opinion? Um, if it would be fully deglycosylated, I believe a lot of the uh, functions or effects that, I mean, on the one hand, functions that it has in joints and the effects that we see in atherosclerosis wouldn't be there, I believe, because they are mainly uh, driven by the glycosylations. Um, yeah, short answer to that. I don't right. think so. So as I told you in the beginning, I'm a protein chemist and I, I synthetically make proteins. So um, I can make proteins up to two, 300 amino acids, uh, hypothetically. Um, if we were to collaborate in the follow-up of this study and we look at the structure of proteoglycan 4, what part of the protein would you like me to make so that you can continue your research and look more into the mechanism of how proteoglycan 4 influences calcification. So I would be very interested, and I think some people in my lab would be happy about that too, um, to understand what the cleavage site for PCSK6 at um, like closer to the end terminal end of the, of the protein is actually doing, because it has been published years ago that this uh, site exists but nobody knows what happens. And since recently PCSK6 
has been um, implied to be an important uh, mediator of atherosclerotic disease progression, it would be very interesting to know um, what happens when it cleaves PLG4, which also seems to be quite important in the, in the atherosclerotic plaque environment. Yeah, thanks. Um, and then finally, I was quite intrigued by your proposition four of your um, uh, thesis, which says that the endogenous PRG4 expression um, is connected to an osteogenic phenotype, but extracellular PRG4 mediates positive effects. So if you would, um, I've seen that PRG4 is used therapeutically. Would you rather add a full PRG4 protein as a therapeutic, or would you take domains to elicit the positive effects that you list here in Proposition 4? That is a very interesting question. I'm, I can't definitely answer it because I, I haven't quite uh, studied to that detail, which... <laughs> I will just briefly answer this question. I, I have not quite um, assessed yet which domains uh, lead to which functions of proteoglycan 4. So at first, I think I would still use uh, the full length uh, PRG4 and then come down to the, to the details. Thank you very much. I'll get the word back to the floor. Right Mr. Sam, I guess, and I'm not quite sure even, that you have noticed that the time for defending your thesis has passed. Uh, the committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And uh, please await our return and the results of our deliberation.
Everybody is back. Yes. Um, Mr. Simon, the degree committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And in view of its positive verdict and taking into account, of course, your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided you has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And this is not a simple degree. This is a special, a double degree um, granted by the Karolinska Institute in Sweden and Maastricht University in the Netherlands. And I invite your supervisor, Professor Schurgers, now to take the floor. Professor Schurgers. Thank you. Till I first uh, announce some words, and do you know what to say then if you agree? Okay. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? You're muted. Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you, Till Simon, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. And as, as evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector the secretary and the supervisor, affixed with the official seal of the university, shown by the beadle. Dear Dr. Simon, dear Till, I have the right as your promoter from Maastricht and the honor to congratulate you as the first person with this fantastic achievement. It for sure was not an easy ride. You know, initiating a joint double ITN European consortium where 15 early stage researchers start working and have at the end to defend their PhD double, not only in Maastricht, but in two days, you will do the same in Sweden at Karolinska which is even more extended than this one hour here in Maastricht. You did a fantastic job, uh, Till. I had the honor to host you a few months at the very beginning, even pre-COVID-19. We didn't even uh, know about this, this terrible virus, but you came to Maastricht and you really made a success out of that. I have to admit, and I also want to congratulate you with that. We had already a fantastic collaboration with Karolinska, and you extended that to the group of Professor Hedan and, and Dr. Matic. And this is not the end of a collaboration, but for me, it's just the start initiated by you. And for that, I really want to thank you. The laudatio now will be given by Professor Hedan and Dr. Matic, because they supervised you from very close by. So I now give the word and the screen to Professor Hedan. Thank you very much, Professor Sugars. Uh, dear Till, uh, congratulations to your fantastic performance and congratulations to us for having you for these years. Uh, this is not the end, it's the end of the beginning, I believe. Uh, you've introduced us into the field of calcification in atherosclerosis that was quite unfamiliar to us. Uh, you also introduced uh, us to bone biology and that was probably one of the reasons why we uh, chose you out of many many highly qualified applicants to this position. Uh, you did not uh, come to disappoint us throughout this journey. Uh, however, uh, you also taught us a different way of doing science <clears throat> and uh, as most of the audience today have appreciated uh, you are a graphical scientist. You've had many, many nice graphics uh, explaining your research to the audience, making it understandable. However, for me, this was a new experience because for a while I realized or I thought that you were more interested in, in setting up your graphics, trying your theories in theory rather than in practice. And for many, many, uh, in many, many occasions, uh, I had to ask you, 
uh, stop drawing your science, just go out and do the work. And you did. But you now not only did that perfectly, you also came back to me and said, look, this is exactly what I predicted would happen in my graphics. Uh, so congratulations, not only on your performance today, your new title. Like I said in the beginning, this is the beginning of the end, but it's not over yet. And there is a disclaimer. I think on the diploma that was presented to you, it says that you have a double degree with the Karolinska Institute. You don't yet. You have uh, one more test two days from now, and then you can enjoy that diploma. But so far, thank you very much for what you presented today. And let's look forward to the rest of this. Thank you. Dr. Matic, may, may I give you now the word as well? Thank you, Dr. Sorges. Well, uh, I will try to be very short, but of course, my experience with uh, TEAL was very intense and close from the very beginning. Uh, so TEAL, first of all, uh, please accept my, my warm congratulations on the excellent performance today and on reaching the PhD degree that we discussed um, four or five years ago, uh, sitting back, you know, when, when you were just interviewing for this position, uh, sitting back in our old building before the moving to the new building. So um, over the years, I have had the pleasure to, to, to supervise you on a daily level and, um, and enjoy all of the intellectual discussions with you, which I think today were very obvious to the committee members and to your other supervisors as well. And this is really something that characterizes your personality and your approach to science and something that we also have discussed a lot, um, the, the, the need to understand details, the need to discuss details and concepts before going to the lab and, and doing them. We are not all the same as researchers. We do not all have the same approach. This has been your approach. And it has successfully led you to a PhD thesis and it has successfully led us into many exciting, exciting new areas to explore further. I will maybe in the end just add that uh, I have had the pleasure to teach you about the structure. <laughs> which you have thanked me about already in, in some nice acknowledgements, uh, meaning that from the very beginning, Teal was not the kind of person that would make plans, take notes, and you know, respect any kind of structure at all, in fact. So uh, this has been my pleasure to teach him. And uh, I'm glad I think we have reached that deliverable as well after so many years. So thank you very much. Um, and, uh, and I'm very happy that you performed so well today. Esteemed Dr. Seymour, dear Till, um, it's my great pleasure to congratulate you with your doctorate and uh, the honor you have required. And I do that also on behalf of the Board of Deans of Maastricht University. And maybe um, you like um, that I share some impressions of the committee with you. Um, well, we have seen a very clear and I think very well illustrated uh, presentation. And also we enjoyed the introduction of your thesis. Well, your thesis was very clear, very well written and on an interesting and a relevant subject. And I think that the committee agrees on the fact that you have really added new knowledge to the field. Your defense was uh, excellent. You um, addressed a number of, uh, well, quite a variety of uh, good answers to a variety of, of questions. And I think you have really showed that you are knowledgeable in the field of your research, but also you have demonstrated your competence as a scientist. And I would like to congratulate not only you, but also your three supervisors with this result that we have seen today. And that means your publications, your thesis, and, and your defense here. And I congratulate uh, Professor Schurgers, Professor Heydit, and Professor Matic with this result. Excellent. And 
I include, of course, in my congratulations, your parents and the other members of your family and your partner, but also your colleagues and friends and all those who have, and I think there are quite a, a number of people who have contributed to your studies and to the end results in your thesis that you have shown today. Um, before I end this um, uh, session, this academic uh, ceremony, I would like to thank all the members of the, uh, this uh, degree committee, but also the members of the thesis assessment committee. And in particular, uh, well, a lot of external members and all opponents for their questions and their interesting academic discussions. Maastricht University really appreciates your contributions. I have come to an end of this academic ceremony and hereby I close this academic ceremony. Don't leave because we have to talk further without out of the live stream. Hereby I close.